So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the brief history of Java from its very beginnings, because I've been working with Java since it was in beta, way, way, way back in like 95 or so. Um, a lot of stuff has changed in Java. I have a lot of very strong opinions on some of those changes, which we'll be talking about tonight. <laughs> so I have a disclaimer. The contents of this presentation are strictly my opinion. <laughs> They're not reflected in any way, shape, or form by Omaha Java Users Group, <laughs> any of you, potentially anybody in this entire building, or for that matter, anyone with the possible exception of me. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. Some of this stuff is going to sound like crazy talk. <laughs> so with that out of the way, I can say whatever I want. I am a software wizard. <laughs> And I'm a coding demigod, <laughs> because, you know, no one's here to dispute that. <laughs> and of course, if there are any .NET people in the room, I need to have a little pictogram for that. Oh, the .NET guy in the back. So there is the title of today's presentation. It's a brief history of Java. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta like, simplify things sometimes for the .NET guys, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> a brief history of me, I'm currently the senior Web App Architect at NCR here in Omaha. I also teach the Java Web App course at Interface. Some trivia about me, that way you can be one of the cool kids. <laughs> you know some stuff about me that not everybody knows. I gave my first college lecture in a Fortran class at the age of 19. That was 35 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's so long. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I've been writing Java since 1.0 beta, which was uh, sometime in 1985. I don't remember if that was early in the year or late in the year. It's been a long, long time ago. I actually had a game at the arcade in the 80s, which is not <laughs> nearly as cool as it sounds. <laughs> but, uh, what was the game? It was a game called Intruder. Intruder. I didn't actually write it uh, for the arcade. I wrote it for a platform called the EPS <coughs> Imagination Machine, which was kind of like an Atari unit. It was just a game console uh, back then, and it sat inside of a keyboard that had tape deck and everything, and it connected together and became a computer. And so I wrote, uh, I wrote a bunch of stuff for that machine, and then the company who owned it, APF Electronics, got purchased by Bally Midway and turned some of my stuff in, uh, turned one of my programs into an arcade game called Intruder. Yeah, it was kind of weird, but yeah, so not nearly as cool as it sounds because, you know, I didn't really have anything to do with it. I just wrote the code and... Did you get any royalties? <laughs> Pardon? Did you get any royalties? No, because <laughs> I sold the TP of electronics and then it was just a game that they distributed. So by the time we got to the arcade, I was no longer involved anymore. So you actually spent quarters on your own game and lost one. I did, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I lost a lot of quarters in that game. <laughs> is there like, an emulator for it? Is there what? An emulator? Can we play it? Uh, I've never looked. Feel free to look. <laughs> <laughs> we have found your Commodore 64 stuff, though, yeah. so it's possible. I don't have any of this on here, but <laughs> I did a lot of Commodore 64 programming, too, and Nick actually found some, some stuff on some of my old 64 stuff from the late 90s, a long time ago. I'm the 2013 Cornhusker State Games chess champion. <laughs> I also have a twin brother, Kevin, who is, coincidentally enough, also a Java developer. That's what he thinks. He doesn't really know Java. Does he, share your opinion? he doesn't really. He's not here to defend himself, so <laughs> he doesn't really know Java. So I've been doing this for a very long time, which of course means I might be biased. However, Java is the one language to rule them all. I'm telling you, it is. It uh, is better than a lot of languages that came before it. It's not as good as some other languages. But, you know, it's kind of hard to argue with success. Java runs everywhere. It runs everywhere from tiny little phones and Android. That's all Java. It runs up in some software on the International Space Station. It runs everywhere. Kind of hard to argue with success. Java does everything. In the beginning, you like a anyone can identify this person without reading the slide? Anyone? Anyone? Giant James Gosling, yes. In the beginning, there was the language C. And uh, C was a really nice language, but Gosling in particular thought that C was kind of hard. It let you do all kinds of things that got you into trouble if you weren't really careful, like a lot of really powerful languages tend to do. So he wanted to make things easier <coughs> and to make them better, kind of to protect 
programmers from themselves. No more walking off the end of arrays and corrupting memory, all the stuff you can do in C. So in Java, you don't have memory management because where Java was going, we didn't need memory management. Let the computer take care of that. That kind of detail work, that's boring. Who wants to do that as a programmer? Pointers, we don't need any pointers. You don't have pointers in Java, it's all hidden away. You don't have to deal with any of that stuff. These are the precepts that Java was built upon. Let's let programmers be programmers. They don't have to worry about all these little mundane details. Of course, way back in the days of assembly language, you didn't really have much choice. That was something you had to do. Threads were built in, that was a novelty back when Java came out. A lot of languages, even C, had threading, but you had to get add-on packages and libraries for that sort of thing. And then it didn't work you know, cross-platform. Languages before Java, as a rule, weren't cross-platform, so you had all kinds of problems with those things. And then, really shockingly enough, there was a user interface, albeit primitive in AWT, that was built right into the language. Languages before that really didn't have that sort of a, a facility. So Java was really pretty groundbreaking when it first came out. But before the beginning, there was a language called Ada, which did almost everything that Java does, and I would argue does it better. And that was back in the 80s. It had memory management with garbage collection. It didn't really do referencing. It protected programmers from being bad and walking off the end of memory and doing things just like Java does. It had threads, even had generics back in the 80s. Java didn't get that until pretty recently. But back in the 80s, they did all that stuff. Didn't have any WARA, okay, trivia time. Anyone know what that means? Write, write, once, once, run anywhere. write once, run anywhere. Didn't really have that, but it was close. Ada, you could cross-compile. It was built from the ground up to be cross-compiling to a lot of major platforms at that time. So it was pretty close to write once anywhere. You still had to recompile, but you didn't have to go scrounging tools together to do it. It came with the platform. And perhaps most of all, Jean Ishbia is a way cooler name than Gosling. That's crazy. He's even a knight. I mean, you can't argue with that. The man's a French knight. That makes him, by default, pretty cool. But meanwhile, back in Java land, there was this new thing that probably one of if it hadn't been around, Java wouldn't have become so popular so quickly. And that was the World Wide Web. It was all brand new. And browsers, which allowed, gave you access to the web, pretty early, at least Netscape did, adopted Java as a platform that they would run inside the browser. That solved all kinds of problems that you had in developing and distributing applications back then. But even though the browsers were pretty terrible, they did run Java, kind of. We'll talk about that in a couple of slides from now. But another, another bonus question. Anybody recognize this guy? Yeah. Who's that? What browser was that? Anybody remember? Mozilla. Mozilla. Yeah, that was the original Mozilla. What a goofy, goofy logo that was. That was crazy. And this, by the way, is not Photoshopped. There actually was a version 9 of Netscape Navigator. <laughs> and that is not Photoshop work. That actually did exist once upon a time. So when Java 1.0 first came out, because of the popularity and the explosion of browsers in the World Wide Web, applets were the thing. I remember back in the late 90s, applets were everywhere. And it kind of uh, evolved naturally out of the fact that all those different browsers did things differently, and nothing worked the same. JavaScript today is crazy easy compared to what it was back in the early days of web browsers. Nothing worked the same. Half of your program was spent checking to see what was supported and what wasn't supported. HTML didn't work the same way. You had to switch out blocks of HTML and other tags because Internet Explorer didn't do the way Netscape Navigator 2 did it. And that didn't work the same way that, Netscape, or that uh, Mozilla did it. And so everything was terribly inconsistent. But in an applet, you can embed what looked like an application or a really complicated web page. Think um, what you do today in HTML5 with a canvas. You could do that all inside of a common code base that you could distribute through the web right there inside of a web browser. But that's the sort of. Sounds really nice, but then it quite work out as to plan. Java 1.1 came out, and it really exploded. 
added all kinds of really interesting features that were pretty new to most languages. Reflection was first introduced. So you could do things that today are pretty trivial, uh, common concepts like in Spring. You could do Java beans, coding by convention rather than configuration. You could introspect classes and figure out how to connect bits together. That's pretty much the heart of what Spring does, at least when it was first written. That was all back in the late 90s in Java when they put reflection into the language. JDBC was added, so now you can finally do something rather than just run on a web page. You want to do some more enterprise type operations and talk to a database, manipulate data. Now you had a way to do that. Java was not pretty heavily in the early days because it was slow. And so the just-in-time compiler was added, at least to Windows, in version 1.1. So that you could actually, at, run, at dynamic runtime, when the classes get loaded, they would then be compiled into native platform code so they could run a lot faster. That was first added in version 1.1. And then RMI, another really big feature, remote method invocation, which just proves the point that you don't get everything right the first time. Mm -hmm. Who's heard of RMI? Anybody use RMI today? You guys use it? Yeah, of course you don't. <laughs> it was terrible. It was a bad idea. It was an interesting experiment, but not everything in Java, as we're going to see in a little while, was a good idea. About the same time, when 1.1 came out, and they were progressing through the different dot releases of 1.1, IDEs began to emerge. So it was no longer code something up in Notepad, open up a console window and compile it with a command. You could actually do your development in an IDE which solved all kinds of things that were kind of a pain before, like mm, compiling in a console and then, oh, reading the line numbers for your errors and then going back into Notepad and hopefully you had line numbers so you didn't have to count them out and find where the errors were and then correct everything by hand and then do the whole process again. That was terrible. That was really, really painful. IDEs really helped that a lot. This is the one I used a lot way back then, Visual Cafe. It died about every 30 minutes at best. It would crash, but you know, it was better than the command line. So everything was made a lot faster and a lot funner. Yes, Melody, I said funner. I did. I didn't say more fun. If I said more fun, it pushed it down, and it was off the screen. So it says funner. That's why it's there. <laughs> Clips wasn't around yet. There were all kinds of other com competition for Visual Cafe. There was the forerunner of NetBeans, which was called Forte. I remember playing around with that back in the 90s. Uh, it was a lot different than NetBeans is today, but some of, the, you know, some of the elements were still there. And then IBM had their Visual Age tool, which was kind of the Cadillac of IDEs. Um, it was pretty pricey. It did a lot of very interesting things. Uh, Visual Age isn't around anymore either. Eclipse is about the only one that's really survived along with NetBeans. So back in 1996, using all these tools and all these great new facilities in Java 1.1, because 1 1.2 wasn't out yet, this is a screenshot from an old application I wrote in 1996. Any Magic the Gatherer players here? <laughs> Anybody? Oh, come on, geeks, come on. <laughs> come on, get them up. I know there's some out there. There's got to be one or two. So that's what this application was. This was a way to play this collectible card game called Magic the Gathering in a multiplayer setting, kind of a client server setting over the web. And because it was all applet-based, and applet-based uh, applications could also be run without a web browser, you had the choice. You could run this inside your web browser, or if you wanted to, you could download all the jar files. This was you know, pre-war files. It was a big old jar file that you would download. Then you would run it from the command line to execute that jar file and get exactly the same UI with the exact same functionality, all based on the old Java.net classes. That was a pretty interesting application to write. All AWT-based. Swing wasn't around yet. So this was all strictly AWT API and a lot of custom drawing stuff to make that work. But it really shows what you could do with Java. This was, what they, this was the vision that Gosling had, was I want a platform independent language with a UI, with multi-threading, with client server functionality built in, so you could do ridiculous applications like this. And you know, boring business ones too. But this was a lot more fun. Then Java 1.2 came out, and you know the people who drive Java went insane and decided that they needed at least three different names for the same product. Java 1.2, uh, 
uh, Java 2 and J2SE, which is Java 2 Standard Edition. All three of those names were interchangeable. I don't know who dreamed up that scheme, but that's just in, I don't know why you need three names for the same thing. And Java really, really exploded back then. It was a pretty small download before. In 1.1, I think the whole download was maybe 2 meg. And when uh, 1.2 came out, it increased by about a factor of four or so. It was huge I mean, for that day, for that time period. The number of classes quadrupled because they added all kinds of really good stuff like Swing. They finally gave up the ghost on ADBT and decided that it was just too primitive. And so they made a proper UI that had a lot more controls and a lot more flexibility called Swing. Anyone use Swing today? Uh, of course you don't. <laughs> That's dead too. You don't use Java for, for UI applications anymore. Used to be a big thing back in the 90s, but not anymore. And collections were finally added. Prior to 1.2, you basically had three. You had vectors, you, well, and arrays, I guess, before. Arrays, vectors, stack, and uh, I'm forgetting the last one. Enumeration. Enumeration, yep. That was all you had. That was it. Kind of hard to get anything complicated done. So a lot of people like me ended up writing their own classes that are now stuff in collection. I've got some, you know, I hesitate to bring this up, but if you, if you go to my website, Twin Peaks, actually that, was, that website's gone. Never mind, you can't go there anymore. I forgot. But uh, my website used to have, until last year, a lot of old programs that I wrote back in the 90s, and it was still running. And I never upgraded any of my software that I wrote to use collections or anything else because I had all the libraries I'd already written that did trees and maps and all the stuff that you didn't have in Java 1.1. And then finally, around the turn of the century, J2EE finally arrived, which added all kinds of interesting stuff to the Java universe. Like, uh, what well, you can actually write web applications you know, CGI type stuff without Perl and without PHP, that's actually possible in Java. Finally was. That was really cool, because anyone who's done anything with Perl, anyone who's done anything with Perl should know that it's kind of crazy. Perl can get out of control really quickly. But servlets allowed you to do the same sort of thing in a Java environment. Now you're platform independent. You can run anywhere you want. A lot more higher level. You had JSPs, so you could combine HTML with Java. And I don't care what anybody says, JSPs are not dead. No, they're not. JSPs will live forever. <laughs> I'm telling you all right now, JSPs will live forever. No one can tell me differently. And EGBs were invented, you know, yay. <laughs> Once again, proving that not everything added to Java was a good idea. Now, some of you who might work in EGB3 might disagree, and I would agree with you. EGB3 is actually pretty good. But I, I really want to emphasize how bad <laughs> EJB1 and even EJB2 were. They were terrible, absolutely terrible. I, I would say they were a mess, but that would just you know, send the wrong message to actual messes. Uh, this is a direct quote from me back in 2000. I can't remember where I was working at the time, but I had to look at EJB specification and ran through it all. And that was a direct quote to my coworker. What is this crap? <laughs> no one will ever make use of this mess. And, you know, who, nobody's EJB1, <laughs> nobody's EJB2. <laughs> EJB3 is still around. It's got some interesting characteristics, but they finally learned their lesson. It took them, you know, a couple iterations, but they finally got through it and figured out how to do that sort of enterprise level of segmentation correctly. It just took, you know, 15 years or so. So shortly after all of that stuff was introduced to the language, IDEs really took off. Uh, Semantic Visual Cafe and uh, the old Forte, those were pretty primitive by modern IDE standards. And they had to grow to support everything that the environment did as well. Eclipse finally came out with a lot of help from IBM. Forte kind of went away and they rebranded it as NetBeans, rewrote a lot of the core stuff that they figured they got wrong, redid it as NetBeans. IntelliJ finally came out, that was a pretty nice one kind of pricey <laughs> at the time. I stayed away from it. I did NetBeans and Eclipse because I, I don't like to pay for tools. I like them for free. And the most important thing of modern IDEs, autocomplete. I was a dictionary for everybody I ever worked with. They could, you know, thumb through their book and try to find the right API, or they could just ask me. <laughs> and now you don't have to ask anybody. 
You don't even have to know the API. Just start typing. You'll get a list. You'll figure out, usually, if it's <laughs> properly done API, you can kind of figure out what you should be calling. It's not that hard. That was really handy. That was mo my, mo my favorite thing about modern IDEs was the addition of autocomplete. And then we're going to kind of lump a lot of the rest of this together. Java 1.3 to 1.6. Frameworks take over. <laughs> Who uses frameworks? Everybody does. Of course you do. Frameworks solve all kinds of interesting problems to help with development. This is just a list I could come up with off the top of my head. Struts and Spring and Tiles and Wicked and Tapestry and later on JSF and SiteMesh, SparkClick. A lot of those are dead now, but Strut, that's because pretty much Spring and maybe JSF to a lesser degree have taken over that space. Everybody uses Spring these days. There's almost no competition because Spring is so ubiquitous. It has so many different moving parts that can solve so many different problems. And now we're going to editorialize a little bit. JSP versus JSF. I told you JSP was not dead. <laughs> and now I'm going to prove it. And to a lesser degree, scriptless versus EL. This is my standard statement on JSF. Anything that you can do in JSF and EL, I can do in JSP with a scriptlet. But the opposite is absolutely not true. So which is more powerful? Of course, powerful doesn't mean better necessarily, but when I'm solving problems in computer science, I like to have the most powerful tools I have available. So when I develop, I develop with JSP. I played around with JSF, but I always ran into problems that I could not solve in a very eloquent way without resorting to jumping through hoops I don't want to jump through that I could solve in a trivial manner with the scriptlet inside of a JSP. I'm not afraid of a little code and HTML mix up. That's okay with me. So what frameworks do for you, this is a pretty standard list I think, they let you get a web app started pretty quickly because there's a lot of plug and play coding. Right, they're doing all that heavy lifting for you. You just have to kind of string some classes together, string some implementations together. If it does all that boring glue code work for you, you don't have to worry about stuff like do post, any of those sorts of, of little lower level APIs. There's lots of examples on the web you can pull from. A lot of people you can ask questions of. A lot of power in that. A lot of people know how these frameworks work and they, they use them all the time. They're always evolving and improving and to help you solve all those problems that you want to solve. However, what frameworks do to you, they do let you get a web app started quickly, and that simply encourages you to not think things through. I've seen that time and time again, especially with less experienced developers. They just start stringing code together against an API and don't really understand, don't really think through what they're trying to accomplish. It causes problems. It does do all the boring glue code work for you, and that way you have no idea what's really going on. If, you don't, if you've never worked with servlets, and I've, I've worked with developers that have never worked with servlets before, and they're using something like Spring, and they come across some problems, they'll tend to have a conceptual gap where they don't really understand what's happening behind the scenes that prevents them from being able to connect the dots to debug a problem. I like understanding exactly what's going on under the covers, and sometimes frameworks get in the way of that. You do have lots of examples to pull from on the web. Uh, of course, a lot of them are wrong, or it's not the version you're using, and the APIs that they're talking about don't even exist anymore, which kind of feeds into the last point. The fact that they're always evolving and improving does, on the good side, mean job security because they don't care about backward compatibility. How many times, I, I can't count how many times I've been working in a framework, whether it was struts or spring, going from version one to version two, and some critical piece of my application is no longer supported in 2.0. I've got to go recode some stuff. And then 3.0 comes out a couple years later, and the same thing happens again. Because as they're evolving, they realize, just like Java did, they didn't quite get it right the first time or the second time. And the only way to solve those problems properly, in their opinion, is to rewrite the API, which I don't necessarily have a problem with, but if you're going to rewrite an API, care about that. Backward compatibility. A lot of Java frameworks 
don't care about backwards compatibility. I love jQuery on the JavaScript side for this reason. Almost everything in jQuery from version 1 to version 10 still works. There are a couple of exceptions, but not the vast majority of it still works. That's a great API that cares about backward compatibility. A lot of Java APIs for some reason don't. Now, I don't mean to pick on Spring here very much, but like most frameworks, it exhibits everything that I had on that previous slide. And they're not really solving any problem that hasn't already been solved. Inversion of control? Oh, you mean callback interfaces? That's been around since the 70s. Convention over configuration? Well, that was back in Java 1.1 with Java Beans. Same sort of a concept. Code according to a philosophy, to a design pattern. That way you don't have to configure as much. Dependency injection? You mean just passing objects around? That's really all dependency injection is referring to, primarily in constructors, but that's okay. So don't get me wrong, Spring does a lot of stuff really, really, really well. It's just that I have a problem with commitment. Commit to an API. If you're going to write some code and you're going to publish it out there for everyone to start using, and then you decide that maybe you need to make some tweaks to that API, that's okay. Go ahead and make those tweaks. But don't not support what you did in the previous version. That's what I have a big problem with in a lot of frameworks. It goes back to backwards compatibility. They just don't care about it. And if you're working on a project, like the project we're doing right now at NCR, that we know is going to be going on for absolute minimum of five years just of development before it has to be out, out in production for 15 or 20 years, I don't want to care that Spring 5 is going to come out and change things. And then five years down the road, Spring 7 is going to be out. After version 6 is a disaster, who knows? It happens. I don't want to be supporting code. I don't want to be supporting code on something that's two or three releases old, only to discover that there's a bug somewhere in that code. And of course, it was two or three releases ago. The open source developers who are working on it aren't going to fix that bug in that old version anymore. It's going to be my job. That's the beauty of open source. If I want to dig through that you know, 500,000 lines of code, I can probably fix that bug myself. That doesn't sound like a lot of fun to me. That's the problem I have with the APIs that don't care about backwards compatibility. And speaking of backwards compatibility, JPA and Hibernate, which is really the same thing. Who uses JPA without Hibernate? Nobody does. Usually you start with Hibernate, feel bad about it, and say, okay, we really got to be a standard, so let's go ahead and, and say that we're supporting JPA, but we'll go ahead and use all of those nice Hibernate annotations because, you know, Hibernate's the only one that really works consistently anyway. So in every project I've ever been involved with, of any complexity, which is the key part, that uses JPA or Hibernate, uh, at the end of the day, at least half of the queries that we end up writing have to be native queries because they're just too complicated to run efficiently in a canned declarative manner, which is what JP and Hibernate does. And if I've got to spend half of my queries writing native queries, why am I using the tool? Sounds to me like the tool's getting in the way. That's my opinion on JP and Hibernate. It solves easy problems really well, really quickly doesn't solve hard problems very well at all. So what is a coder to do today? Any suggestions? What do you Brails. think? What? Brails. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> you could. Yeah. There's, a lot of, there's a lot of good glue code there. <laughs> That's for sure. It ties things together pretty neatly. Any other suggestions? Frameworks aren't all bad. There are good ones out there, as long as you're willing to live with the little list I had on the baggage that comes with them. But I like to say, just write your own damn code. <laughs> it's not that hard. And you don't end up with a 30 megabyte WAR file. You end up with a 200K WAR file. Because the 1% of that framework that you're using on your application, you can just write yourself. It's just not that hard. I like to say that you hear this phrase as developers all the time, don't reinvent the wheel. But I think that's the wrong attitude, because if we don't keep reinventing the wheel, we'd be driving cars with stone tires. I think that's a bad idea. 
That's it.